This is a production of Cornell University. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Lots of uh, happy faces here. Um, welcome to Cornell University and Mann Library. I'm, uh, I'm Ann Kenny. I'm the Carl A. Kroc University Librarian here at Cornell. And I want to thank President Federico Sancho and our host, uh, Mary Oaks, for this opportunity to speak this morning to you all. We are pleased uh, to have here at Ithaca the uh, World Congress of the International Association of Agriculture Agricultural Information Specialists, I-A-A-L-D, that just rolls off the tongue. I'm trusting you all made it here to beautiful upstate New York without a hitch in your travel plans. If you all did, that would be amazing. <laughs> the program planners have arranged four days worth of plenary sessions, workshops, tours, meetings, and opportunities to get together and share information and insights. Um, we should also thank them for arranging to have much cooler weather than we have been experiencing over the past few weeks. The weather even looks promising for tonight's uh, old-fashioned barbecue on the Ag Quad. It's wonderful to be able to host this conference here at Cornell, the land-grant institution for New York State. For those of you who are not as familiar with that designation, it was 101 years ago that the Morrill Act of 1862, the Land Grant College Act, was passed to increase access to research and education in America. The grant was originally set up to establish institutions in each state that would educate people in agriculture, home economics, mechanical arts, and other professions that were practical at the time. The Land Grant Act was introduced by a congressman from Vermont named Justin Smith Morrill. He envisioned the financing of agricultural and mechanical education and wanted to assure that that education would be available to all. The Land Grant has improved the lives of millions of Americans and has become a major educational resource for our nation and in so doing has changed the way higher education is taught today. With its passage, the purpose of education shifted away from a near exclusive focus on the classical studies to encompass more applied studies uh, that would prepare students for the world they would face once leaving the classroom. Increasingly, land-grant institutions, including Cornell, have extended that mission beyond their own states to encompass the world, and so we are doubly privileged to welcome you here today. This is the 14th World Congress. The first one was held in Belgium in 1955 when IAALD was officially started. Recent Congresses include venues in France, Japan, Kentucky, and Senegal. And today, IAALD has members in over 75 countries and produces a peer-reviewed journal, Agriculture Information Worldwide. And here in upstate New York, we have 110 registrants from 28 different countries represented. It is the belief in understanding and improving how the agricultural researcher, the teacher, the student, or small uh, holder farmer might access the latest information in order to defy food security issues that continually brings IAALD participants together, and this week's Congress will be no exception. The World Congress presents an excellent venue for us to exchange ideas, review methodologies, demonstrate new technologies and new approaches, and understand the needs and constraints of countries worldwide as we work together to build strong agricultural information ecosystem. You have before you an opportunity to explore and share and discuss emerging priorities in discovery and access, content management tools, and institutional or individual collaborations, which are so key today. In a content-rich era that is shaped by open source technology, user-driven content, and partnerships. 
The theme for this year's Congress, Emerging Priorities for Scientific Information, is totally appropriate. Over the four days, participants will be treated to 41 papers, six hands-on workshops, and five plenary sessions, all designed to examine this theme very expansively. We will hear from information professionals, scientists, and practitioners in agriculture who will examine an array of rich topics ranging from online learning to data curation to special collections, information literacy, capacity building, outreach, information uh, access, mobile technology, and social media. On Wednesday, you'll have an opportunity to experience New York State agriculture through farm tours and a dinner on Seneca Lake at Daniel's, which is uh, one of my absolute favorite restaurants. It takes a global village to create a sustainable and an accessible Congress, and it's important to recognize everyone's contributions. So, first, let me congratulate the conference planning teams led by Jaron Porciello, Holly Misselbauer, and Jim morris Noor of Cornell Library. Thank you, all of you. <laughs> they have been ably assisted by a whole host of Cornell Library staff members, and we are grateful for their time, energy, and effort that they have invested in this conference. Our 21 sponsors have been critical in their support. They include publishers, government agencies, standards bodies, professional organizations, and scholarly entities. The full list is in the conference program, and many are here as well. Please join me in thanking them. I do want to give a special thanks to CTA of Netherlands for providing sponsorships for 15 of our accepted paper uh, presenters from Africa, Caribbean, and the Pacific countries to attend this conference. For many presenters, it is their first trip to the United States and their first conference. So welcome. And I also want to acknowledge the IAALD Executive Board, who tapped into the power of online crowdsourcing to raise funds for travel sponsorships to bring people to Cornell. You're part of a unique organization that provides worldwide leadership in delivering agricultural information, and we're looking forward to the opportunity over the next four days to share and learn uh, from each other. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce the keynote opening speaker, Dr. Simon Liu, Director of the National Agriculture Library, the United States Department of Agriculture. His presentation is sponsored by the United States Agricultural Information Network, USAIN. Prior to joining uh, the National Agriculture Library, Dr. Liu was an Associate Director of the National Library of Medicine, the Acting Director of Information Management and Security at the Department of Justice, the Chief Information System Architect at the Treasury Department, and a Program Manager in the private sector. He holds two doctoral degrees in computer science and higher education administration from George Washington University, a Master's of Arts degree in government from Johns Hopkins, a Master's of Business Administration degree from the University of Maryland, a Master's of Science degree in Computer Science from Indiana University, and a Bachelor of Science degree from Chongyang University. He is an editor-in-chief of an information technology magazine, an editor of a journal, and has published widely, including a book and more than 60 book chapters, journal articles, and scholarly papers. Please join me in walk welcoming Dr. Simon Liu, who will be speaking about an, a, a fairly challenging topic, public access to agricultural data. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, thank again for the kind introductions. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, the weather here is just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I drove all the way from Washington up here yesterday, 
and I can see the temperature de decrease, decrease, decrease. So by the time when I got here, I feel cold. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, let me uh, talk, get into uh, the discussion here. My topic will be uh, public access to agricultural data. This is something that uh, near and dear to many people's heart today. So here is the things that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, I will give you introductions and then talking about uh, opportunities and challenges we are facing and then looking at the approach and different approach, different strategy that we need to adopt and also talk a little bit about action plan, especially from our end, in terms of how to respond to the changes. Uh, but before I begin, let me kind of insert some kind of uh, out of scope uh, introduction here. Uh, the National Agricultural Library was established in 1862. So this year we celebrate 151 years anniversary. So at that time, President Lincoln established two things. One is the USDA as a department, and also the National Agricultural Library at that time. So we are 151 years old. Currently, we have about over 6 million plus uh, volumes of uh, collections. So one of the largest agricultural information collection in the whole world. So we are located in uh, Beltsville, Maryland. It's outside Washington, D.C., a little bit uh, outside but not too far away. So uh, if you happen to stop by Washington, D.C., please give me a call. So we would love to have you visiting us. Thank you. So with that, uh, let me get started with uh, the presentation here. As you know that uh, public access is really uh, the key things that right now uh, people are pushing for. If you're looking the outside in the whole world, uh, UK, the, the Research Council is pushing for public access. Any kind of fund, federally funded research output, research results should be accessible by the public. So uh, the same thing, the friends from Canada also doing the same thing. The Welcome Trust, uh, the, uh, the NGO organization also pushing for the same thing. Uh, as far as within the United States, as you know, the NIH has been pushing for N uh, public access uh, to the research results since 2004, at the time was kind of voluntary. However, by 2008, it became mandatory. So NIH has been doing this thing for five years. As you all know that uh, back in 2010, the Congress passed the American Competes Reauthorization Act. Essentially, this particular act indicated that any federal research result, including two things, one is the scholarly publication, one is the research research data you collected. Those two research results should be make them publicly accessible. So after that, uh, the, early this year, the OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy within the White House uh, published a memo that it reiterated the same thing. And also back in February, February this year, the Congress by two party, Democrat and Republican, both in the House and Senate, they introduced a bill so-called Fair Access to Science and Technology Research Act. So this thing uh, has been going on for some time, but this year is very different because of bipartisan support and uh, momentum seems to be moving very, very strong. Uh, last May, the president also issued a so-called executive order. Uh, this one particularly talk about public access, not just only for the human being, but also for machine readable. That means that we need to have the capability to facilitate the machine to machine interface. So like I said, the public access to research results, essentially they cover two main topics. One is the scholarly publications. Another one is a scientific, scientific digital data set collected by the research. So let's look at the trend of the sky publications, growing numbers. If you look at the chart here, uh, beneath that uh, growing numbers, I was, last week I searched the Scopus, uh, looking for the publications in the past close to decades. As you can see, the number of publication growing. I'm, I wish my salary grow this way. <laughs> and uh, so growing numbers. Another thing is that right now, the publication is no longer just text, it's multimedia. Uh, it's, it's in addition to text, you also have a video, you also have audios, and so on. And also increasing uh, the interactions. 
Uh, the magazine that, that I'm, I'm the, uh, serving as an EIC uh, editor-in-chief, the magazine had the, my target audience, they demand the interaction. That means that our magazine to have some kind of a video and audio and uh, facilitate the interaction between the, uh, the reader and also the author. So uh, this really is the trend and also the linkage to the environment. Uh, the article is along itself is not, it's good but not that good. We need to link all the content within the articles, uh, link them with the databases, link to uh, and other applications or link to other web pages. So it's kind of interlinkage that create a power of discovery environment. And lastly, the publication become more and more mobilized. Uh, today, people see everybody, uh, when they walk, they have uh, handheld devices on their hands. So mobilization is very, very important. Now let's look at the uh, scientific data, uh, the data side. If you look at the left-hand side here, uh, this is in the past. We have data desert. At that time, uh, it's hard to get, to get the data we want. Uh, there are many, many different reasons. However, right now, it's different. Different right now, data become tsunami. Data, data keep coming. Many of them you, you see that uh, you involved in the genomic research. Uh, as you know that uh, back in the 90s, NIH spent $3 billion, take 10 years just to sequence one human genome. 10 years, $3 billion. Today, how long is it gonna take to sequence a human genome? Only a few hours and only maybe less than $2,000. So you can see the changes. And uh, a human genome is about three billion base pair of the gene pair. And then any kind of like a rice or the soybean or the corn, they have a roughly between 500 meg to one billion base pairs. So the information just tremendous. Now I saw the, a news report indicating that there's a company in UK, they have invented some sequencing machine. Just like six, the size of sequencing machine in the past 10 years, 20 years ago, it's bigger than uh, it's on the stage, this big. Right now, a sequencing machine could be just like this. So in the future, you can see everybody in the pocket, you have a sequencing machine here, so you carry your own laboratory on the move. So that's really, really amazing. All the data generated need to be handled. Those data will be swampy. We as researchers will be swimming in the sea of the data. They will be drawn by the data. So who is going to come to rescue? All of us, the librarian. We are a so-called informa information expert. So we need to come to help the research scientists to handle this data tsunami. So the data tsunami looks bad, but it's, it's also good. If you look at this one here, you offer new opportunity. This is the person, you all know that in the past, uh, this is the way we conduct the, uh, the research, collecting the data, and then find, analyze the data, and then publish the paper. This is uh, the old way of doing things. However, with the data available right now, this is the new way, so-called data-intensive scientific discovery. Right now, you can literally dive into the data set and the data mining, and then to be able to make scientific discovery through those data. So this is an opportunity. Of course, it's a challenge, but also present an opportunity. Uh, now here's, let's talk about challenge. How are we gonna handle those data? Well, who is gonna handle this? All boil down to human being, expert. So if you look at this chart, you can see here, on the left-hand side, this is a research by, um, and, uh, an organization that uh, they do this uh, kind of survey indicating that uh, we are facing the shortage of the technical talent to handle those big data. So on the left hand side you can see current uh, back in 2008 we have about roughly about 150,000 people working on these things and all the university produced the people 180,000. So by uh, year of 2018 that's a 10 year horizon we, some people it's gonna retire, so by 2018, we're gonna have about 300,000 people available to handle big data. However, we need to, 
we need to have people between 440 to 490. This means that we are facing a gap. The gap here is really this one here. Roughly, we are facing 140,000 in that range people. So training become very, very important. Uh, really, uh, we need to make sure that uh, our people, we have enough pipeline to educate our people to be ready to handle big data in the future. And also, we are agricultural people, agricultural inform in information specialists. So agricultural information is so unique. It's very different compared to other disciplinary. Uh, so we have unique challenge because the agricultural data is collected from everywhere. You know, our agricultural ecosystem really tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands around the world. Uh, they're all different. So the data collected at those different sites. So as a result, data is really dispersed to everywhere. However, nowhere to be found. So this is the challenge we face. And also, they, the agriculture research covers so many different areas, economic, genomic, crops, animals, and nutrition, you name it. So the data set is so heterogeneous. There is no one size fits all solutions. Another one is uh, data sharing. A lot of people, they are collecting the data on their laboratory, they own the data. Uh, the culture of data sharing need to be changed. I'm sure that all of us have the obligation to make that kind of move. Now here's the question. How are we going to respond to all those challenges and opportunity? Are we going to do the same old, same old like we did for the past many years? Can we afford to do so, do the same thing? I guess not. So this is uh, something we got to do. We need to have a new approach. The new approach to handle the trend in terms of the scholarly publication, to handle the trend in terms of the tsunami from the scientific data set side. So now the question is that how are we going to do it? What would be our approach? So let me begin to look at the, the approach here. So if you look at this one here, it's kind of uh, analysis uh, from the left hand side, the yellow thing. So from the bottom one, you can see this. We are collecting data. We are the data or information. It's a literature, literature or scientific data. We're collecting the data. Somehow we're storing those data and information. Store them online or archive offline, and then we also need to engage in the long term preservation of those data and information, also literature. So this is what we need to do. In addition to that one, essentially satisfy those things that today with the technology, with the, uh, the, uh, the information technology, the storage devices are going down, the price going down, so this will not be a huge challenge. However, the challenge is on the top layers, in the middle layer. We need to have people to organize the data, to curate the data, organize the literature, curate those literatures. And not only that, we need to provide a very, very good discovery environment, allow people to access and also retrieve the data, retrieve the literature we want in a very, very uh, flexible, user-friendly way to do things. And also, we need to facilitate machine exchange, the exchange of information, and then be able to dis disseminate data either in a retail mode or in a batch mode. So you need to have some kind of capacity to facilitate the machine-to-machine -machine interface so that uh, we can have uh, all the computers, all the information system, they all connect together. So those are really the challenges. And on top of that one, people, today, the people working in the, in the so-called social networking. So social networking become an important element adding to the information management arena. So the, the social network and the collaboration become so important. And then uh, on the top here is, if you look at the data, we have so many different type of data. They, if they stand alone, they will be isolated. It's kind of items. Those items would not have much value to it. So the, the holy grail of so-called scientific data set is really the inter integration. Link them all together. Link them together, I, I shouldn't say all, but uh, as possible, as much as possible. Link them together and then be able to provide environment so that we not only be able to compute, but also be able to analyze, synthesize, and visualize the data. And only by doing so, we can help the scientists to advance the research and to speed up the scientific discovery. So this is really the holy grail of all of us here. 
Our job as a librarian, our job is to provide the environment for the scientists, for our general public to do discovery, to speed up the scientific discovery. So that's our job. It's not just say, hey, we provide a book and provide this kind of information. So if you, if you look at these things uh, on the left-hand side here, you will see that the data collection is just on this end, more on this end. However, we need to have information management. So this is where we are. Maybe here you need to have focus a little bit more on IT side, but this is a librarian. You need to work on this one here. And also on the top is really the information management. So essentially the evolution. The data itself would not be useful. We need to connect the data, associate the sem semantic meaning and put the data, connect the data, and also the literature into the, into the environment, into the content. So make it become information. Not only that, we need to elevate information, make it an, a knowledge, so that people will be able to take action based on those knowledge and produce the impact. And change either our research, change the practice, and then speed up the scientific discovery. So this is uh, what we need to do. Now, on the right-hand side, you will see the corresponding technology and expertise we need to have. So we need to have people like uh, computer scientists and also information scientists and information management and also the knowledge management expert. So in a sense, to respond to the, the trend in the scholar publication and also in the trend in the scientific data set, we need to think about our skill set. Our skill set and also the pipeline of our future employees. So given that, uh, let me kind of speak a little bit in words. Uh, this is uh, what, I, what happened within the National Agriculture Library. We, uh, we went through a reorganization last year. Uh, so right now it's about almost a month in, into the reorganization. Essentially, I reorganized uh, National Agriculture Library into four different divisions. One is with the data production, uh, data, collecting the data, and so on. And then uh, moving the data to the information, really aggregating the data, linking the data between the data and also literatures, and then uh, provide the context, provide the environment, and uh, to facilitate, facilitate the research and facility, facilitate the discovery. And uh, at the top here is the knowledge services. We hope uh, this will be a circle continue the circle, collecting the data, converting the data into information, and then converting the data information into knowledge. And in the middle is really the information system. So IT play a key role here in NAL. I'm sure in, the, in many, many other organizations. So let me kind of, kind of uh, get into so-called action plan here. Um, I know I have uh, about only uh, 35, 40 minutes, so I talk a little bit fast. Uh, so let me kind of uh, spend a little bit more time talk about how we're going to handle the scholarly publications. So this is uh, the way we plan to handle. So we envision that the uh, National Agricultural Library will mimic PubMed and PubMed Central. So in a sense that uh, we like to create an environment so that uh, people, the general public, will be able to access to the scholarly publication from two fronts. One is the citations. Another one is the full tabs. So this one is in response to the OSTP memo in regarding to the public access to scholarly publications. So let me explain to you how this thing is going to work. Everything will be sitting in the middle of a so-called repository. Within this one here, the repository will have the citation full text sitting over there. Now the key thing of the whole system is the bottom line here, the bottom box is here. It's so-called manuscript submission system. So essentially this is the, the facility allow us to collecting all the data. I hope the author here, all the authors here, they will be happy to be able to submit the data, uh, submit the scholarly publication to this manuscript submission system. What they're gonna submit it, there are two things. One is the citation records, another one is the scholarly publication. Doesn't mean that uh, they need to submit those data per se. Uh, we're looking for if this enter enough information, we will be able to use those information to retrieve the data we want. 
So for instance, citation record, if you can give us DOI and other things, we will be able to go get it. Okay. So hopefully, the author will be able to do so. By the way, it kind of give you a, a sense in terms of uh, within the USDA. Currently, USDA as a whole, we have about annual research funding is about $3.5 billion in that range. Uh, back in uh, 2011 and 12, in that time frames, USDA intramural program produced about 10,000 articles. I'm talking about a peer review journal articles. It's about 10,000 intramural. A lot of uh, the, uh, the uh, 10,000 articles, uh, majority of that produced by agricultural research services and also forest services and many other agencies uh, within USDA. Now extramural. Uh, extramural, probably we have about uh, $1.5 billion extramural funding uh, that uh, go to NEFA, uh, National Institute of Food and Agriculture. So those funding really generate I would say more than 10,000 articles because uh, many of many of the uh, the fund we provide is a joint funding with uh, like a National Science Foundation, the DOE, and other institutions. So as a result, some of the grant they receive partial funding from USDA. Some of the grant receive the full funding. So if you count the partial and full funding, the number of publication will be more. By the way, the way we define so-called scholarly publication derived from USDA, we define like this. It's the peer-reviewed scholarly publication arising directly or indirectly, fully or partially from USDA fund. So if you are looking at this definition, the extramural funding will produce more articles. So we are talking about, on an annual basis, a USDA annual peer-reviewed article is 20,000 plus. As far as uh, how much plus, it remain to be seen. So, and also let me kind of give you a picture in terms of where we publish. Again, I'm talking about intramural because uh, intramural we have pretty good control. We know who the authors are. Extramural is a little bit challenging. So I'm talking about the things I feel accurate to talk to you all. I know the library folks we are in the library industry, accuracy is very, very important. So let me talk about only intramural for the time being. So among those 10,000 articles, they are published everywhere. They are published in more than 1,600 journal titles. 1,600. And those 1,600 journal titles was published by more than 400 publishers. Oh, that's a wide variety. Some of, them are, some of them are big, like Elsevier, some of them are smaller ones. So it's a widespread. I'm sure the extramural will have the same distributions. As we all know, the majority of our paper is published in the big five publishers, published by big five publishers. But it's just like a curve, uh, the bell curve shape, it's a long, long tail. So as a result, when we when we implement our solution here, we need to take care of not only the majority, but also the long tails. All right. so, so here is that the publisher. We are, we are really uh, began to engage with a lot of publishers. Uh, hopefully in the future, instead of have the authors submitting their data, we can go get the data from, go get the literature from the publisher directly. So like I said, we have thousands of journal titles we need to deal with and also hundreds of publishers we need to deal with. It's a challenging work. Uh, we have been uh, working with uh, the, um, the federal interagency working group, uh, working with uh, public and private uh, partners, uh, try to find a solution so that we can facilitate this data submission, uh, this uh, publication submission as smooth as possible and as less painful as possible. I'm sure that the, Authors, those scientists, they'd rather spend their time to do research rather than spending their time sitting in, the com uh, sitting in front of the computer to submit their data, submit their scholarly publication. So anyway, all the all this publication information submitted here will be put in here. However, on this end here, we need to curate the data, so we have an indexing mechanism. Behind the indexing will be the, the NAL, uh, the Thoros. Uh, right now, the Thoros itself has about uh, 90,000 some 
90,000 plus term. We are approaching 100,000 terms right now in both English and also Spanish version. So they will, this will be the indexing. After we indexing, so that means that we are going to attach so term, uh, so called the, the, the source terms, those are control vocab vocabulary, those terms, maybe a dozen to an articles, and then make them uh, really facilitate effective re uh, retrieval. On this end, so you have a search and a discovery environment allow the people come here to be able to search, not only the citation, but also the full text. And the top here is the data management really for us to curate and then to do the QA and so on. And the API here is really to facilitate the machine-to-machine -machine interface so that you will be able to retrieve the data, retrieve the articles, not only one by one, but also in a batch mode. And also uh, searching by your computer and so on. On this end here is this. We need to make sure that we are complying with the OSTP memo so that there will be an association. The articles you produce and also the grant you have. So there will be some kind of association allow us to keep track who comply, who don't. Okay. So essentially this is the kind of things that uh, we are building right now. Again, uh, a lot of components we already have right now is the linkage. And also we are working with the public and private partners so within uh, USDA and also within the federal community and also the publishing industries and try to put this thing together. Our time frame is this, uh, it's about a year from now, this one should be in operations. So you can anticipate the next August or September time frame, this system, so-called popback, will be in operation. So let me kind of zoom in a little bit about the indexing here. You know, indexing is a human, is an intellectual process. In the past, was uh, done by human beings. So human beings reading the articles, try to select 10 or 12 terms out of this 10,000 term. I'm sorry, not 10,000, 100,000 terms. Select a dozen from 100,000 terms attached to the article. That's an intellectual process. However, with the, the budget sequestration, so we can no longer afford to use in human beings. So automation is one way to do it. Now, uh, of course, people will question that, what, what would be the quality? Anyway, here is our indexing thing. We have been experiment, experimenting these things for more than a year now. Uh, the result was very, very promising. Essentially, automatic indexing, there's no one single solution. There's no one single shoulder bullet. So as a result, we use a cocktail hybrid approach cocktail approach. We use a combination of many, many different artificial intelligence technology. So for instance, we use, uh, of course, this one lexical analysis, analyzing, you need to do a lexical analysis uh, to looking at the articles, and also the natural language processing, be, be, be able to do, understand the natural language understanding, understand the meaning, the concept behind the articles. And then we also have the rule base. As you know, as you know the rule base can only go this far unless we have very, very specific rules that we can specify. So using rule base to capture the knowledge itself is one thing, but it would not be complete. So as a result, we have so-called regular expression. This is a more uh, generic, way, generic way for us to express the knowledge inside the human being, inside the indexer, their brain, and then be able to express. And then have the pattern recognition, uh, looking at different patterns, uh, and be able to recognize the pattern by the machines. And also, the fuzzy logic. A fuzzy logic is something that we use, uh, even though human being, sometimes you say this term, yes or no, perhaps, and so on. So fuzzy lo logic, and uh, behind the fuzzy logic is really the statistic behind that. And also the machine learning. We hope uh, this, our, our system will uh, continue to learn. Right now, our system has been through about half a million articles. So half million article to train this system. And the system has accumulated some kind of knowledge. And I, I'm anticipating this system will become smarter and smarter in the future. Now, this is what we have. So on the left-hand side, you have the thoroughs, 100,000 terms. And then our full text or abstract getting in. And the output will be the enriched abstract or full text. So this is our process. Let me kind of give you an idea in terms of our current progress. 
This year, we will be able to index roughly about 180,000 180, articles. And why, if you look at the agriculture industry as a whole, maybe roughly estimation. Uh, again, don't quote my number here. Allow me to have some kind of approximation for the time being here. Agriculture-related uh, publication on an annual basis right now approaching, it's about half a million. I'm hoping in the future, NAL will be able to index half a million in the future. But we need to make sure that we have enough good quality. So right now, what we do is that we're looking at all the, the journal titles, uh, roughly thousands of journal titles. Uh, we identify a few core journal titles. It's in about 1,200 journal titles. We feel that those are the core, hardcore agricultural titles. And they have the articles published in those uh, titles. Uh, they have strong fingerprint. And we will be able to use the, the combination of those technology to kind of capture the knowledge among those articles, uh, dealing with those articles, and then to do it. Uh, as far as the quality, really, if you look at the industry, the quality is really the precision of recall. And we are, we are using the harmonic average of the precision of recall, we so-called F-score, to measure the quality. F-score will be between 0 and 100, 100 being the best, 0 will be the worst. And I have seen, I have seen uh, over 10 systems in the industry to see what is the average F-score. I would say if your F-score can go over 70, that would be superb. Now I'm pleased to report that uh, some of the articles, like I said, hundreds of, uh, across a thousand, art, uh, a thousand journal we have, they have strong fingerprint. We are confident right now, based on our random, cho random uh, QA, random QA, our S score is over 70. So that's, uh, I'm very, very confident. And then, of course, our, our random QA is still random, okay? But in the future, I anticipate that uh, uh, will become more and more accurate. Our goal is this. As the machine getting better and better, we are gonna re-index everything. So maybe this year we indexing. Next year we re-index because the machine getting smarter. Next year we re-index, machine getting better. So this is our game plan. All right, let's kind of get into the data side. This is our conceptual view in terms of how we are gonna hand handle scientific data. I talk about a scholarly publication. So here is the scientific data. So you can see here, our principle is this. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Anything out there available, we like to leverage this. As you can see that uh, NCPI, this is my previous organization, National Library of Medicine, they have a famous gene bank. So if you have a genomic research, either human, uh, the human genome and other animal genome, some of the plant genome also can submit to here. We like to leverage these things. In the agricultural field, I plan, this is the National Science Foundation, they, are, they, are, they have uh, 12 million grant to establish iPlan, we like to reuse these things. Within USDA, ARS, we also have a lot of databases. So those things, they already exist here. For instance, if I'm a genomic researcher use, uh, ser doing the research on, say, corn genome, soybean genome, it's a very good chance the result will be published here or put in here. In this case, I don't need to have anything. All I need to do is go to iPrint and put the genome data there. May iPrint allow us to assemble the genome, annotate the genome to be able to put the genome set, genome, uh, the gene set there. However, if we're doing, say, uh, a field, a soil, soil research, well, they may not have any kind of soil research prominent database out there. So what we need to do is uh, put it here, put it into the USDA data repository. In the middle here, we will have a data catalog so that you know this is, will be the master, the pointer, point to where the data is. And then the API to facilitate machine-to-machine -machine interface and also the web, and in web the portal front end to, inter to facilitate the human interface. So here is the data producer. Any one of us, just like this person, we produce the data, we're looking for, are there anything out there we can deposit? If not, I put it here. So on this end is the data consumer. The data consumer was sitting here, 
and come here looking at the data catalog and be able to know where the data reside, either come to here or come to here or come to here or come to here to retrieve the data. So you can see that uh, this kind of approach is really is a practical and also hybrid approach. It's, a, it's a leveraging the investment, either existing investment that's already out there and also the new investment. And also leveraging the USDA existing invest, investment and also external. That means uh, other federal agencies or public and private partners. Centralized and decentralized. The catalog will be centralized, however, the data will be decentralized. The data will be good and decentralized so that they are sitting into the environment belong to their domain area and closer to their dom domain experts so that they can better manage and curate it. And also standardized and domain specific. Like I said, the, the agricultural data is uh, so heterogeneous. So there is no one standard, one size fit all, none. So some of the standard we will be able to uh, I would say centralized, standardized, in this case will be the data cataloging metadata. We like to centralize, really standardize, standardize those data catalog, data element. However, the data set itself will be domain specific. So the access, again, access will be either central or distributed, depends on the discipline you belong to. So this will be our approach in terms of handle the scientific data set. Now, scientific data set management is a little bit challenging and also uh, is a little bit, uh, I would say, it's n there's no one particular solution out there. So it's a combination, it's a hybrid approach. So uh, the progress will be a little bit slower compared to the scientific data set. I would say if you look at this picture, it will be years from now. Okay, but this will be our concept, our direction for the future. So all you know, we just need to do things together. With today's budget, with today's data, humongous amount of data, huge volume of the data, complex data set, also the velocity of the data set. There's no single organization can do it along. So we need to work together. I'm looking forward to the partnership, the collaboration from this distinguished group. And let's journal together, journey together. Let's work together to conquer these things. I hope our next World Congress, we can all sit in here and say, hey, last time when we gathered in Cornell, we worked together we somehow find a good solution. Thank you all. I think my time is up, so I assume I don't have time for Q&A, do I? If not, okay. Let me take a couple of questions. Anybody? Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, my name is Deva uh, Reddy. I am from Texas A&M University. Uh, my question is, uh, it's very good that you have given an excellent presentation. But as far as the collaboration is concerned, of course, you said that you are going to index millions of documents and other things automatically indexing everything. What's the role of the gap that is a common competitor that is a I don't uh, quite capture the whole thing here, but uh, essentially is that there are some uh, system existing out there and they are already doing these things. How are we gonna collaborate with the rest of the system? Am I right? So essentially it's the collaboration, uh, 
uh, that's the general theme here. Let me talk about collaborations. Um, uh, I will say that uh, the, the collaboration will start within the USDA, within the uh, USDA agency, and right now has been expanded to the federal community. Uh, as a matter of fact, right now, the federal community, we have so-called interagency working group almost on a weekly basis, looking at the, the scholarly publication, also scientific data set. Like I, I mentioned earlier that uh, we have been working with uh, uh, the solution in the public and private, uh, that include also APLU. APLU uh, has proposed a, a concept so-called SHARE. Uh, the SHARE is a system really to handle the scholarly publication. Uh, we, are, we, have been meeting, uh, we have been meeting with them for uh, try two times, and we have been meeting with uh, the public, uh, I would say the private sector like the Google Scholars. Um, we also meeting with the, the publishing industry. Uh, publishing, inst publishing industry right now propose a solution so-called course. Uh, we have been working with them. Of course, we are working with uh, national, uh, the National Library of Medicine, especially PubMed and PubMed Central. Now, any, I assume that the, uh, especially the land grant university, the, the academic environment, you are working with uh, the SHARE, uh, the consortium for the SHARE. I'm sure that in the future, SHARE and other solutions will come, uh, come together. So there will be some kind of collaboration, some kind of interaction or some kind of integration together, so. Thank you. I can't move. Okay, for us short people, if, if someone has another question, you can come to the mic to ask your question. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, how is the name Thesaurus different from AgroVoc? Uh, we, uh, I work with uh, uh, legal information and we map that to AgroVox. So I like to know how is that different from NAIL. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's an excellent question. As a matter of fact, uh, Steve Rutger from FAO. I don't know, Johannes, you're here or not? Okay. So we recognize the, uh, the SORUS, the SORUS itself uh, need to be integrated right now. FAL have a sort, have control vocabulary. We do have con control vocabulary. As far as the organization is, a, uh, might be a little bit different. Uh, uh, maybe uh, one is a little bit on classification side, one is on the uh, so-called source side. But I'm sure that uh, we have been talking about these things, try to integrate them together. As a matter of fact, this is not only uh, Stephen and I and uh, Johannes has talked about these things uh, uh, in the past few months and also have talked to uh, the uh, Seaguard organizations uh, so that uh, we, our goal is that in the future be able to integrate them together. So as far as the, the timeline uh, need to be established, but the general direction we all agree. I hope I hope we will, the agricultural industry will be able to kind of marching this thing together. Since I came from the, uh, the uh, medical background, so let me kind of give you a, a little bit of background in terms of medical field. In the medical field, there are so many control vocabularies. How many do you happen to know? I don't know if you recognize there one thing happened within the National Library of Medicine is so-called Unified Medical Language System, UMLS. For the past many years before my departure from NLM, I managed the UMLS production. So UMLS itself, if you look at the, the, library, uh, the, uh, the vocabulary within the medical industry, there are over 100 50, 150 control vocabulary available in the whole world right now. So as you can see here, of course those 150 vocabulary, they all may be in different disciplines. However, they use, they're all different. There could be classification scheme, there could be SORUS, there could be, um, there could be the ontology, and they're all different level of sophistication. So integrate them together is a challenge. It's a challenge. Now in the agricultural field, 
Right now, we have only a few so-called authorities for the time being. Stephen and also um, Seagar people. And I, three of us, uh, we have some kind of discussion. And our goal is that uh, to kind of develop some kind of plan to merge those control vocabulary together. Hopefully, in the future, we, have, we need to only speak one language rather than multiple language. Thank you for the question. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.